So I'm Tim Maudlin. I'm a professor of philosophy at New York University. Um, you've um, written a lot or thought a lot about quantum mechanics um, and um, a lot of people see it as um, the most accurate, as like giving the most accurate predictions um, compared to other scientific theories at the moment. Uh, but your latest, well some of your latest work looks at how um, quantum theory is actually a misnomer. Would you be right. able to um, explain this to us? Right, so there's no doubt and no one's going to dispute that there's a mathematical formalism that we know how to derive predictions from and those predictions can be accurate to 14 decimal places. But what a theory is, what a physical theory is, is more than just a mathematical formalism with some rules. It should specify a physical ontology, which means tell me what exists in the physical world. Are there particles? Are there fields? Uh, is there space-time? and tell me about those things, and then specify some laws about how they behave, that tell me how they behave through time. And the problem is that there is standard quantum, what's taught as quantum theory isn't, isn't a theory in that sense. It's just the formalism. And then what people call interpreting quantum theory, which sounds like a funny thing to do, because you'd say, well, I have a theory. What's an interpretation? Uh, what's called interpreting quantum theory is really the development of precise physical theories that make the same predictions or nearly the same predictions that you get out of this standard mathematical recipe. Uh, and so this to me clears up a kind of funny question because often they say, oh, a, a physicist would say, well, I've got quantum theory. What do I need an interpretation for? Let the philosophers do the interpreting, whatever that is. And that's because the language is misleading them. No, you don't have a theory. You have a predictive recipe. And what we want, as a physicist, what you should want is a theory. It's something that makes clear statements about what the world is. So does that mean that actually quantum mechanics um, is a lot stronger um, in its predictions than um, the kind of public broad audience thinks? Or does it mean that they're not there yet and they still need to work towards um, having the status of a theory? Well, the, there are different approaches um, that people have been working on. This is a very minority group um, who work in foundations of physics. So there's a whole approach um, that goes back actually to 1925 and Louis de Broglie that's called the pilot wave theory. There's another approach that are called objective collapse theories and Roger Penrose is working on those. And, uh, some other physicists, uh, Giancarlo Girardi uh, particularly, worked on versions of objective collapse theories. And these are just different theories. And they all make the same predictions insofar as they have been tested so far. So we can't go to, into a lab and say which of these approaches is right. Even though in principle, sometimes these different approaches make slightly different predictions, you have to think very hard about how you could actually test them. And what does quantum tell us about um, physical reality? Well, that's what's interesting, is that these different approaches would give you different answers. So if, you, if I say, well, I think it's the pilot wave approach is correct, I'm going to say, well, it tells me uh, that the quantum mechanical wave function is not a complete physical description, and maybe the world is deterministic, and so on. And if I take an objective collapse theory, I'm going to say, that tells me the world is fundamentally indeterministic. And so there's no single answer to that. The one thing we know for sure is that there's a kind of non-locality, and this comes from a theorem of John Bell, which doesn't depend on the interpretation. John, John Bell proved that just certain results that you get in the lab cannot be reproduced in a theory that is local in a certain well-defined sense. So there has to be some non-locality. Where do you stand um, amongst these theories? Uh, I mean, I have a slight, but this is just my preference. My, my aesthetic sense is that the pilot wave approach seems more natural to me, and the objective collapse approach seems to me um, more unnatural. But I wouldn't you know, give a lot of attention to my aesthetic preferences here. They're both very serious. They're trying to write the theory down in completely precise mathematical terms. 
And everybody should pay attention to all the going things that are actually out there that have a chance of being right. What does it mean that um, you have like this aesthetic preference for? Um... Well, in the so in a collapse theory, for example, to give you the reason it's called a collapse theory is that you have a wave function that all the theories use, and you have equation Schrodinger's equation, which is a deterministic equation that tells you how this wave function evolves through time. And in the pilot wave theory, that's the end of it for the wave function. That's all it ever does. And in a collapse theory, the wave function sometimes collapses. It does something very different. So for a long time, it'll be doing this. And then all of a sudden, it'll do this or do that. Um, and, and it'll do that in a completely random way, that, that the theory will tell you, well, there's some chance it'll do this and some chance it'll do that. And in order to specify that theory, you then need to add some new parameters to tell me how often this happens and how it happens and so on. So there's more new data or new constants of nature that go into specifying that theory, whereas in the pilot wave theory, it doesn't have that. And to me, that it feels more natural. Um, even John Carlo Girardi, who developed this objective collapse theory, he always said, well, for him, this was just a kind of um, stopping point. It was, a, it, it was a way toward a deeper theory. He never thought the theory he himself wrote down felt fundamental to him, that he thought there must be something deeper beneath it. Um, but these are all very subjective judgments, um, and I wouldn't put that much weight on them. Um, but to you, it is important that direct impressions inform um, scientific theories. And um, for instance, you take the view that time is real and an actual thing. Yeah. <laughs> could, you, could you talk a well, bit about, I, that, about look, that? Physics, any empirical science, has to start from what the philosopher Wilfred Sellers called the manifest image of the world. That is, the world as it presents itself to me when I just open my eyes. And of course, we know that some of those appearances can be deceptive or misleading. Uh, you know, the, the, the ore in water looks bent, but it really isn't, and so on. But you have nowhere else to begin but with the manifest image. And then you try and produce theories that would explain it or account for it. And part of the manifest image of the world is that it's in space, a three-dimensional space, and in time. And time goes on, and things happen in a certain sequence, and they take different amounts of time. And uh, I can't imagine really what it would be like to say all of that is an illusion, like the ore being bent in water. And there's no reason to think it is. So, so especially time structure, we know how to put it into the fundamental physics. And the idea that, no, this is all an illusion that derives from something else, I don't even know how you'd ever get to an idea. I mean, you can say, oh, maybe it's like the Matrix and we're all plugged into a machine by aliens. But there's no way to get to that, right? The, 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 the hypothesis is built so you can never test it. Um, and so I think there's been a, I think all of the talk about time being an illusion is just a misunderstanding of relativity theory and so on. And I diagnose that in very specific ways. Why is it a misunderstanding of the relativity theory? Um, because relativity doesn't suggest at all that time is an illusion. It suggests that the temporal structure of the world isn't what we naively thought it to be in very specific ways, but that there is time and that time is directed and time goes from past to future and you can't go backwards in time. Um, all of that is just the natural way to understand the theory. It's certainly the way Einstein understood the theory. Uh, there's a funny thing I have to mention. There was a, a note that Einstein wrote, a note of condolence to the family of his friend Mikhail Besso when he died. And this, this note Einstein wrote three months before he himself died. And in it, he writes very poetically about how, oh, the physicists now know that time is an illusion and so on. And everybody quotes that as if this was Einstein's considered scientific view which makes no sense whatever, because he never said that in any scientific paper. He never said that in places where he's expositing the theory of relativity. He was writing a note to cheer up people who had just lost, uh, lost their son. 
and it was a very kind thing for him to do. But the idea that he had this view of time that he kept all to himself until three months before he died and then, and then wrote it down in a note, um, and, and that's how to understand the theory of relativity, that makes no sense at all. But people like it. It's, it's the, if someone says, oh, time is an illusion, that sounds amazing, oh, you know, wow, tell me about that. But I, I just think there's really nothing to, to it, quite honestly. Is that um, an issue of celebrity science in general, that um, we start mixing up serious work with uh, a public persona that um, uh, the, these scientists develop? Yeah, there's that and there's the temptation, quite honestly, and it's hard to resist it, certain things are just sell. I mean, they're kind of sexy or they're kind of mind-blowing. And there are some amazing things we've discovered, and I think Bell put his finger on the fundamental new thing about quantum mechanics, but if someone says, oh, a cat can be both alive and dead at the same time, or there are an infinite number of parallel worlds or something like that, that just sounds like science fiction, and people react in an emotional way to it, and they're attracted to it. And so it's very easy to want to repeat things like that and get this rise out of the audience. Um, and I, you know, you understand that people are tempted that way, but my job is to try and say, look, Let's slow down here. Um, they're very interesting results, but let's not mix them up with pure speculation or you know, things that just sound fun. So in your view then, Schrodinger's cat is just a sexy kind of... Well, the Schrodinger cat thought experiment, when Schrodinger wrote it down, had a very serious point. And his point was that the, the understanding of quantum mechanics that Bohr and Heisenberg had produced, which goes by the name the Copenhagen Interpretation, was completely unacceptable because it had this consequence that a cat could end up neither alive or dead. And Schrodinger said, that's ridiculous, right? That tells you you've made a mistake, Bohr, right? That tells you you've made a mistake, Heisenberg. Go back and think again. And so the, the example had a very serious purpose. It, the purpose wasn't to convince you that there are cats that are neither dead or alive, that was supposed to be the absurd consequence of a bad interpretation that tells you don't think that way. We, needed, you know, we need to understand this theory. But now we've, we have this theory presented as reflecting um, kind of quantum mechanics in physics textbooks. Yep. How did we get here? So the, we got here because the, there were really two phases to this, I think. Um, one was early on, Niels Bohr, who had some kind of amazing magnetic personality that I don't understand, but you just see his effect on people. He loved these kind of weird, Gnostic, hard to understand pronouncements. And, and he thought the key to quantum mechanics was that you couldn't understand it in normal ways of thought. And we'd sort of reach the limit of our intuitive understanding of the world. And he pushed that very hard and said a lot of very uh, obscure and inscrutable things and, and very strongly enforced that other people say this. And uh, people like Einstein just never put up with it. I mean, that's why Einstein hate, you know, really did not like Bohr and the Copenhagen, and he was always fighting against it because he saw it didn't make any sense and it was obscure. And so this, the few people who were fighting against it really got sidelined very politically. And then when it came to the United States, all of this Borean kind of hard to understand semi-mystical philosophy got kind of thrown away and then it became shut up and calculate. So they said, look, just don't ask us questions like what's really going on. Just we have a thing that you can use to make good predictions. Just use it to make the predictions and don't ask these. And that when I studied physics as an undergraduate, that happened to me in my first quantum mechanics course. I put up my hand and asked the physics professor well, is it like this? And, he, and, and his answer was, no, you can't think of it that way. But then he didn't go on to say, here's how you think of it. It's like, don't think of it, right? You know, just calculate the numbers. And so this shut up and, you know, this was, has become known, it's not quite clear who started this, is shut up and calculate. And that's a practical point of view if all you care about is making predictions. But if you care about what the world really is, not about building bridges or making microchips, but if you're just curious what's really going on, shut up and calculate doesn't get you anywhere. 
And so the physics textbooks are all written by people who never studied these questions because they were told not to ask them and not to think about them. They were very explicitly told, do not think about these questions. But if a theory helps you make predictions, um, shouldn't it also, like, doesn't it take what the world really is or what reality really is so, into account? So let me give you a very simple example. People knew for thousands, thousands of years ago that aspirin will, will actually have medical uses. It'll make your headaches go away. They knew that empirically. They didn't have a clue, even long into the 20th century, how it works. They knew you took the bark of a certain tree and you chewed it or whatever and your headache went away. Now, if all you care about is getting rid of your headache, you're happy. You don't care how it works. So you can have something that tells you very effectively, practically what to do and not have a clue why it works. You may know that it works, but not, it, it, but not have a clue how it works. And that's what's happening in quantum theory. Yes, that's exactly what's happening in quantum theory. We have a very effective mathematical recipe for grinding out predictions. And those predictions are really accurate. So there's something in that recipe that reflects the real world. But exactly what reflects the real world and how, you can stare at that mathematics from morning till night and the mathematics won't tell you. You so, need a physical theory. Um, so the way you present um, the kind of fight for truth in quantum physics um, sounds like a bit of a power struggle. Uh, what's the role of power in science? Well, power is, there are some people who literally are good at wielding institutional power. And in academia, I, you, you know, you have to get a position, you have to get tenure. If you're a physicist and you are interested in these foundational questions, it will kill your career, or it used to. Now it's a bit better, but there was certainly a time where literally you could not get a job if you said, I'm interested in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Not in a physics department. You could get one in a philosophy department. And maybe you could get one in a math department as a mathematical physicist. And the hardest place was in a physics department. There are some people who, you know, really, and Bohr early on, knew how to use institutional power. But that's not usually what happens. More, it's just you do what your professors do. You know, you're, you're, you're brought up in a certain culture, and if in the culture is don't ask these questions, you just don't ask them. And if you then go on to teach, you tell your students don't ask them. So it's not so much the imposition of power in a hard way. It's just uh, the kind of influence that the general zeitgeist around you has. What would you like to happen in um, the academic environment, um, in, in particularly in um, what physicists are doing about quantum now? Uh, what I really want to happen, what I'm working hard right now in a practical way to happen, is simply to have foundations of physics recognized institutionally as a legitimate enterprise that it's, it, it's something that some people can devote their lives to. And if you're a physicist who doesn't care about it and you just want to make the predictions or you just want to run the experiments, fine. But you say, there are these people who are interested in this question and they're doing also a serious kind of work and to have it, have it recognized institutionally. Um, it would be nice if every student who learned quantum mechanics at least got a three-page accurate description of the situation, right? If you really want to understand the foundations, then you have to have classes in foundations. Sometimes I, I, I mean, I, I, physicists have this idea because they have a physics PhD, they must, they must know all these answers. And if you then, but then you have to ask, well, where did you learn it? It wasn't in your textbooks. You never learned foundations. You never took a course in it. You never read a chapter about it. You never read a book about it. Why do you think you know about it? All I really want people to do is to recognize that this is serious work and they're serious people. Some people in physics departments, some people in math departments, some people in philosophy departments, working on a common project. And it's a legitimate project and it needs support. Thank you so much. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.